In the video on Introduction to Shear Stresses, we define shearing as the sliding of two layers of material across each other due to parallel forces that act on those layers in opposite directions. These forces were external to the material. In this video, we'll discuss shear forces that are internal to the material and are induced inside the material. Consider the following beam that's made out of steel. The beam is supported and is stationary under static equilibrium. Steel is a metal mostly made out of iron and some carbon and some amounts of other elements that are metallically bonded together. We can zoom into the steel down to the molecular level and represent it as shown here, where the circles represent the steel elements and the lines represent the bonding in them. Now let's apply a vertical force downwards to the first layer of the material. What we expect to happen is that the downward force will cause the first layer of material to be pushed downwards, causing deformation in the vertical plane. This deformation might not be obvious or visible in steel because it's strongly bonded, but in other softer materials like wood, it could be visible. If the force is strong enough to break the bond between the first layer and the second layer, then the first layer will shear away and slide across the second layer. But if the bond is strong enough, then it will resist the external force and prevent shearing. If the beam is supported such that it's not translating or moving due to the external force, then it remains in static equilibrium. To maintain static equilibrium, then the second layer must apply an equal and opposite force to balance out the external force. This force that's generated inside the beam is called the internal shear force and is given by the symbol V. V has the same unit as force, that is, it's a unit of newtons. The magnitude of V is equal to the magnitude of the external force, but the two forces will be in opposite directions. Now, if the external force was upwards from the bottom instead, then the internal shear force will be directed downwards in the opposite direction as the force that it balances. In these two examples, the shear force is induced by an external force. These external forces could come from the loads that the beam is supporting or from reactions from supporting members, but they can also come from internally as well. Let's consider the first layer of the beam. As a beam is made out of solid material, it will have a mass given by its volume and its density. This mass then gives weight to the layer due to gravity. In order for the second layer to hold up the first layer, the second layer must then create a shear force that opposes the weight of the first layer in the opposite direction. Let's now move to the third layer. Here we have two layers on the left side of the third layer, which the third layer has to support. If we assume that the beam is homogeneous, in other words it's made from material of consistent density, then the shear force in the third layer will be twice as large as the shear force in the second layer because it has to support two layers. We can continue to move along the beam and see that as we move from layer to layer, the next layer progressively has to increase its shear to balance the increase in mass of the beam on the left side of that layer. If the length of the section of beam been supported by the shear force is x, then the weight of that section is given by its uniformly distributed load, or UDL, multiplied by the length of that section. If you've forgotten what a UDL is, go back to the UDL video for a refresher. Now, let's do some numerical examples. Before we look at an example, we need first to consider the sign conventions. In the description of shear, we started with the left side of the beam and moved to the right. We could have just as easily moved from the right side to the left, but the normal convention is to move from left to right, and this direction is considered positive in the convention. So the left end of the beam is our starting point and is the origin. To work out what the internal shear in the beam is at any point along the beam, we cut the beam at that point and calculate shear relative to the left end of the beam. So. Let's cut the beam at an arbitrary point and separate the two sections so that we expose two surfaces at the cut point. If the left surface has a force pointing down and the right surface has a force pointing up, we call this negative shear by convention. Now, if the left surface has the shear force pointing up 
and the right surface has a shear force pointing down, then we call this positive shear by convention. Now that we've got the sign convention out of the way, let's do some examples. Consider a beam that's 10 meters long and has a UDL of 10 kilonewtons per meter. In other words, the beam has a linear weight of 10 kilonewtons for every one meter of the beam. Let's work out what the internal shear force is at one meter into the beam. First, we cut the beam at one meter from the left of the beam, which is the origin. Then we calculate what the weight or load of that section is. The shear force from the opposite side must be equal to the weight of the cut section but in opposite directions. So the shear force vector points upwards. The weight of the beam is given by its UDL multiplied by its length. Since the UDL is 10 kilonewtons per meter and the length of the cut section is one meter, then the weight of the cut section is 10 kilonewtons. Thus, the shear force on the other side of the cut surface must be equal to 10 kilonewtons in order to support the cut section. So V is equal to the weight of the cut section in magnitude, but points in the opposite direction. And, by convention, since the left force points down and the right force points up, then the shear force is negative. Let's repeat this example and cut the beam at 7 meters. At 7 meters, the weight of the cut section is its UDL multiplied by 7 meters, which gives us 70 kilonewtons. So the shear force at the cut point on the surface must also be 70 kilonewtons pointing upwards. Another way to calculate this is to consider the equilibrium conditions in the vertical direction. When using the equilibrium equation, it's important to consider which direction in the vertical axis as positive and which is negative. Let's use the upward direction as positive. So we write the equation as the upward force minus the downward force. The sum of all forces up to the cut point in the vertical or the y direction must be equal to zero for static equilibrium. So we write the equation as V minus W equals zero with V being the upward force and W being the downward force. If we rearrange the equation, we get V being equal to W, and since W is 70 kilonewtons, then V must also be 70 kilonewtons. Notice that the answer is a positive value, indicating that V is pointing upwards. But by convention, it's still called negative shear. In other words, if the beam was to shear at 7 meters due to the force acting on it, the 7 meter section would shear downwards in the negative direction. And we can do this at any point along the beam to determine what is the internal shear force at that point due to the self weight of the beam. Now let's add some supports to the analysis. A beam is now simply supported by two supports, A and B, at each end of the beam such that there is no net force along the horizontal direction. We will only deal with vertical forces here. So support A will produce an upward reaction at the left end and support B will produce an upward reaction at the other end. The value of these reactions will be 50 kilonewtons since they evenly support the beam which has a total of 100 kilonewtons. If you're unsure or forgotten how to work out reactions, check out the calculating reactions video. So let's cut the beam again at 1 meter and reanalyze the shear force at 1 meter with the support included. As with previously, the shear force on the right of the cut must balance with all of the forces on the left of the cut. We've previously calculated the weight of the 1 meter section to be 10 kilonewtons pointed downwards due to gravity. So now we have two forces acting on the 1 meter section. We have its weight of 10 kilonewtons pointed downwards, and we have the reaction from support A of 50 kilonewtons pointed upwards. The shear force is the reaction to these forces acting on the cut section. If we're unsure what direction the shear force vector should be, don't worry, because the calculations will reveal the answer. So here, let's assume that the shear force vector points upwards for now. The condition for static equilibrium in the vertical direction can be written as the sum of all of the upward forces minus all of the downward forces being equal to zero. Again, we're taking the outward direction as positive. So rearranging this equation and solving for V, 
we get V being equal to the weight of the 1 metre section minus the reaction from support A. So here, we end up with a shear being equal to negative 40 kilonewtons. What this tells us is that the internal shear force on the right side of the cut actually points downwards instead of upwards with a magnitude of 40 kilonewtons. For our next example, we'll add a point load onto the beam. And we're going to put this point load right in the middle of the beam at 5 metres from the origin. This point load could be an object with its weight concentrated in a very small area on top of the beam. So with the extra load, we need to recalculate the reactions from the supports. As the point load is centred, the two supports will support this load equally. And so support A now produces a reaction of 60 kilonewtons, that is 50 kilonewtons to support half the beam and 10 kilonewtons to support half the load. Likewise, support B will also produce the same reaction of 60 kilonewtons. Both reactions point upwards. Now let's cut the beam at 7 meters from the left and work out what the shear force is at 7 meters. So the weight of the cut section is going to be 70 kilonewtons. When we write the equilibrium equation for the vertical forces, we now have an extra variable for the point load, which points downwards, so it's negative in the equation. So there is a net downward force of 90 kilonewtons. Rearranging the equation to solve for the shear force, we get the shear force being equal to the weight of the 7 meter beam plus the point load minus the reaction from support A. Subbing in the values, we get a shear force to be equal to positive 30 kilonewtons. So the shear force vector points upwards. Finally, there are many examples in textbooks that use weightless beams and looks at point loads only. In these examples, the weight of the beams are negligible compared to the loads and the forces acting on them, so they're ignored. Consider an example here where we have a beam with negligible mass that is 10 meters long and simply supported by two supports at both ends. In the middle of that beam, we place a point load of 20 kilonewtons. Since the only downward force is from the point load and it's centered along the beam, then the two supports, A and B, will support a same amount equal to half the downward force. In other words, each support produces a reaction of 10 kilonewtons. Let's cut the beam at 2.5 meters from the start of the beam and work out the shear force at 2.5 meters. To write our vertical e equilibrium equation, we simply add up all of the force vectors from the start of the beam to the point of cut. In this case, the only force before the cut is the reaction A, which points upwards. So our equilibrium equation is simply RA plus V equals zero. Rearranging for V results in V being simply equal to the negative of RA. And since RA is equal to 10 kilonewtons, then V is equal to negative 10 kilonewtons. So our shear force ends up pointing downwards in this case. Now let's cut the beam at 7 meters and calculate the shear force there. Let's assume that the resulting shear force points upwards. Again, we write the equilibrium equation for all forces in the vertical direction from the start of the beam to the point of cut, and we get the sum of all vertical forces being equal to RA and V being the upward forces, minus F being the downward force to be equal to zero. Rearranging for V gives us V being equal to F minus RA. And subbing in the values gives V being equal to positive 10 kilonewtons, indicating that the shear force vector does indeed point upwards. In summary, when analysing internal shear forces in solid beams, we need to take into account the physical mass of the beam, which also induces an internal shear stress within the beam due to its own self-weight. To calculate the internal shear force at any point along the beam, cut the beam at that point and vectorally add up all of the vertical forces from the start of the beam on the left side all the way to the point of cut. Such forces can include the weight of the section of the cut beam, any reactions on that section, and any additional loads on that section.
In static equilibrium, the net shear force is equal to the sum of all of those vertical forces that are acting on the cut section. If the resultant shear force points upwards, this is called negative shear, and if the shear force points downwards, this is called positive shear.